national. Um, he hails from Minnesota, uh, the land that also brought us, among, uh, besides freezing weather, um, Keith Ellison and the first um, Muslim woman elected to the state legislature on this round of elections um, in Hanuma. Um, and uh, Imam uh, Asad Zaman is a distinguished leader in the Islamic movement, youth development, interfaith programming, nonprofit leadership. He is executive director and Imam with the Muslim American Society Mass in Minnesota. Um, and uh, he co founded the Minnesota Rabio Imam Roundtable, which he has co hosted since 2011. He has provided training to over 200 police officers serving in various Minnesota police departments. In 2005, he co-founded the Muslim Day at the Capitol. This model of civic engagement and advocacy has been replicated in nine other states, mashallah, and at the nation's capital. Imam um, Asad is active in interfaith activities and has trained, trained and has trained um, uh, a speaker as Speaker's Bureau, sorry, to deliver presentations in churches, synagogues, corporations, and government offices. He, he chaired the Mass Minnesota Convention several times as well. In 2005, um, our speaker was appointed by the governor of his state to the Board of Teaching. Upon confirmation by the Minnesota Senate, he served until 2009. He was previously a Policy Fellow of Minnesota 2020, and Huber Humphrey Policy Fellow at the University of Minnesota. Imam Asad has made Minnesota his home since 1992. Imam Asad holds uh, Ijaza certificates in uh, dozens of classical texts in Hadith, Thoqa, and Atida. He received his Master's of Business Administration and Bachelor's of Science degrees from the Carlson School of Management at the University of Minnesota. Uh, we welcome Brother Asad to warm Southern California. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. إن شاء الله today I would like to talk a little bit about cultural competence and and I want to connect it if possible with the idea that the Muslim American society mass exists to convey the message of Islam with the utmost clarity. So that's in the mission statement, right? To convey the message of Islam with utmost clarity. And we want to understand how do you go about conveying Islam to the people? And we see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explains this concept. He describes the first Rasul that he sent among the people who were lost. Nuh And the pattern of Nuh exists till today. This is why the story is being told to us in the Quran. See, we cannot go to a people and we cannot say to them, listen, you are stupid, I am smart. You are inferior, I am superior. Listen to me. Nobody will listen to us. This, by the way, is part of the problem of the Muslim narrative in America. That we perceive ourselves as different and sometimes as better than those to whom we deliver the message of Dawah. And by the way, Dawah does not work like this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes in Surah Al-A'raf, لَقَدْ أَرْسَلْنَا نُوحًا إِلَىٰ قَوْمِهِ And we did indeed send Nuh to his people. فقال, he said, Ya Qawm, a'budu Allah ma lakum min ilahin ghayr. O my people, worship Allah, you have no God but Him. Now look at this part. Inni akhafu alaykum adab ayyub bin ahdi. I am afraid for you that something bad will happen. See, look, look at the difference. So a person comes to a people and says, Oh stupid people, listen to the smart person like me. Versus somebody comes to a people and says, Oh my people, Ya Qawmi, Oh my people, I want to protect you from something that might hurt you. See the difference? Which of the two messages would you want to hear? The people want to hear the second message, not the first. This is why Allah describes how Muhammad 
salam, as he gives da'wah to the people. And he spent more than 900 years giving da'wah to his people. And he does not say to them, oh people, why don't you listen to me? I know you do not know. Instead he says, فَقُلْتُ اسْتَغْفَرُوا رَبَّكُمْ إِنَّهُ كَانَ غَفَارًا يُرْسِلِ السَّمَاءَ عَلَيْكُمْ مِدْرًا وَيُمْدِدْكُمْ بِأَمْوَالٍ وَبَنِينٍ وَيَجْعَلْ لَكُمْ جَنَّاتٍ وَيَجْعَلْ لَكُمْ أَنْهَارًا He begins by saying, Allah will forgive you. You made mistakes, it's okay. Come back to Allah. You like wealth, you like children, you want to have gardens, Allah will give you more. Let me show you how you can get more. See this difference? We see in Surah Al-A'raf, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes, وَإِلَىٰ عَادْ أَخَابُ الْمُودِ To the people of Aad, we sent their brother Hud. Allah describes, وَإِلَىٰ ثَمُودِ أَخَابُ الْصَالِحِ To the people of Salah, to the people of Thamud, we sent their brother Salah. Now see, when we give this example, I once gave a khutbah where I explained this point at the end of the khutbah, somebody said, Shaykh, it's very nice what you said. But these people in America are very bad people. They do these evil things and so on and so forth. We cannot call them our brother. My brothers and sisters, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was so angry with Aad and Thamud that he destroyed them. Yes? And Allah described the Rasul as a khawm, their brother. Think of this statement. How will the people of America listen to my message if I begin by saying I want the destruction of America? I don't want it. Why, why would anybody listen to me if I begin with this? So no da'i doesn't come like this. The da'i comes from the perspective of care and concern. I once said, God bless America, and a Muslim had a concern with that. Why would you say God bless America? Why would I not say God bless America? I live in it. It affects me. How can I give da'wah to the people if I do not embrace them? Now just so we are clear, embracing my American identity does not mean I agree with everything that happens in America. These are two different things. See what I'm saying? These are two different things. The Rasulullah when he moved from Mecca to Medina, he embraced his identity as a citizen of Yathrib. Okay? He changed his allegiance. And this is, my, my, my brothers and sisters in Islam, this is kind of a big deal. Because after the battle of Mecca, after the conquest, after, after the Fatih of Mecca, not the battle, the Ansar were worried that the Rasulullah will go back to Mecca. Because now Mecca is under Islam. That's his home. Mecca is the place where there is the Kaaba. It's the best place on earth. Will the Rasulullah go back? So the people of Medina became very concerned. And there was all kinds of grumbling going on in the, among the Ansar. And the Rasulullah convened the Rasulullah convened a meeting of the Ansar alone. And Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu heard about this meeting. He said, can I come in? He said, no, you're not allowed to come in. It's a meeting for the Ansar. And in this meeting, it's a long, long hadith, by the way. It's one of the few hadith that's like three, four pages long. In this meeting, the Rasulullah said something very interesting. He said to the people of Medina, Ya Ma'ashar al-Ansar, O people of the Ansar, I am with you and you are with me. If the whole of Arabia goes one direction and the Ansar goes a different direction, I will be with the Ansar. 
See, why is it important? Yeah. You are not Muslims, right? The Ansar are Muslim, the Muhajirin are Muslim. Mecca is Muslim, Medina is Muslim. Why is it important for him to reaffirm his identity as belonging to Medina? See, the Rasulullah when he entered Medina, he signed a treaty called the Medina Treaty. This treaty, by the way, is older than the Magna Carta. It constitutes the world's first written constitution. Okay, the Europeans like to think they invented everything. They did not. So in this treaty, the Rasulullah did something very interesting. He said, there are two groups. The migrants, the Muhajirin that came from the Quraysh, and the locals, the people of Yathrib, whether they are Muslim or whether they are Muslim. And then the Rasulullah said, they are one ummah, min duni nas, to the exclusion of all other people. It's a very interesting document, by the way. It's a political document where the Rasulullah by this excluded from the Medina Republic Muslims who are outside Medina, who have not yet done Hijrah. And he included in the Medina Republic people who did not take Islam. Muslims. On the date of this treaty, less than 20% of the people of Medina were Muslim. And then he said, and the Jewish allies of these tribes are like them. They have the same rights. So this treaty of Medina took four groups of people. The Muslim Muhajir, the Muslim Ansar, the Mushriks from Yathrib, and the Yahud from Yathrib. These four are one ummah in doing less. And the Rasulullah took upon himself the task of defending all of these people. It's my job, I will defend them. Why would he do that? Because that is part of being in a civic society. So we all know from the hadith, I'll try to expand the horizons of the people. We all know that the first construction project that Rasulullah did was what? The first thing he did. The Masjid al Nabawi, right? He built the Masjid al Nabawi, it's the first thing he did. We gotta have Masjid. But what was his second major public works project? It's in the hadith, by the way, you find it in Bukhari. No, this is, this is, this is, Muwafa, he did this, but this is not, this is not a building project. He did not construct, he did not do construction. Yeah, this is the Muwafa. This is the brotherhood. But this is not a physical building. I'm asking what was the first and the second things he did, public works. Uh, let me summarize because we have to keep moving. We see in the hadith that Yathrib was surrounded by swamps. And there were lots of mosquitoes. And anyone who came to Medina became sick. The hadith tells us that all the Muhajirin became sick. They were suffering from malaria and dengue fever. So the hadith records that the Rasulullah made dua. You all know this dua, right? Oh Allah, cause us to love Yathrib as we love Makkah or even more. You know this hadith. Aisha radiallahu anha was sick. Then the Rasulullah after doing dua, he did something very interesting. He went and he drained the swamps. He constructed a bunch of sewers, a sewer system, so that the rainwater would not collect around Medina and give an infestation breeding ground for mosquitoes. Think of this statement I'm telling you. The second public works project that Rasulullah did was to build a sewer system for a city where 80% of its citizens are non-Muslim. 
He took Muslim money and Muslim labor and he commanded them to build something that benefits non-Muslims. Also Muslims benefit from it. Because today you go to Medina, it's a hundred percent Muslim city, so we cannot visualize this. Right? So I was explaining this concept and somebody, one of the shuyukh in Minnesota asked me, he met me then a few days later, he said, Brother Asad, did you really tell people in a khutbah that Allah sent his Rasul to Medina to build a septic system? He said, no, Allah did not send his Rasul to build a septic system. But the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came as rahmatun lil alameen and he found the people in need. And it does not matter at this point, are these Muslim people or Catholic people? They are people they need to be served. See this concept? Now we look at the situation in America. So we have a very strange mindset. And you know, I, I love mass, I'm part of mass. But I'm going to call out mass. Look, we're Americans, right? How many of you think we're Americans? Raise your hand. Okay. Where is the American flag on this is there a problem? That's a problem. Why did we assume that the Tea Party has the right to this flag and not you and me? It's my flag. How can we relate to this country if we don't embrace it? Say, yeah, brother, but you know, this flag is used to do all kinds of injustice and this and that, and how can we have our flag, this American flag, on our Islamic state? But look, how many people here are Palestinian? Good, mashallah. How many of you support the cause of Palestine? Do you demonstrate that support by carrying a Palestinian flag sometimes? You do that, right? Do you know this flag is the representative is being carried by a very, very corrupt person named Abu Mazen? You, you all know this, right? So when we carry the Palestinian flag, we are not carrying the corruption of Muhammad Abbas, we are carrying the hopes of the Palestinian people. Yes or no? Yes. Okay. How many of you are Egyptian here? Any Egyptians with you? You love the Egyptian flag? You do, right? You know that the Egyptian government is currently responsible for starving to death human beings in Gaza? Yes. Unfortunately. Yes. So when I carry the Egyptian flag, I carry the hopes and aspirations of the Egyptian people, not the corruption and evil of its government. Yes or no? Yes. Why then is America different? How is that valid? Why do we not apply the same logic? Why can we not carry the American flag here? I want to see, I, I challenge my brothers and sisters in this mass chapter that there should be an American flag on our stage at all times. We're Americans, it's ours. I do not surrender this to the Tea Party. It's my flag. How if we do not embrace the identity of this country? By the way, I don't, when I carry the flag, I don't have to support everything done in its name. I have the right to do what Muhammad Ali did. Just, I support America, but I am not going to go in Vietnam and kill a bunch of people who have not harmed me. And by the way, Muhammad Ali is great not because he won two Olympic, two championships in boxing. Many people won two championships in boxing. That's, it's a big deal. But there are more than 30 people like that. Muhammad Ali is great because he participated in a fight where he did not throw a punch. He stood up to the oppression and he asked the question, why are we killing innocent people in Vietnam? And for that crime, he was sent to jail. And that is what makes him great. So much so that when the Olympics were brought to America and they wanted an athlete to represent America, they choose Muhammad Ali. All Americans, 
agreed that Muhammad Ali is best qualified to represent America at the Olympic stage, so he is the one who should last the Olympic play. Why would they make that choice? If not for the fact that this person embraces and cares for and wants to benefit America. That is the only basis on which we can do that. My brothers and sisters in Islam, there are many issues and concerns and problems in this country. And we Muslims are being selfish. We have the solutions to many of these problems from Islam and Quran and Hadith. And because of our inability or unwillingness to interact at a valid cultural level, we are depriving this society of those benefits. That is not fair. That is unjust. See, I'm from Minnesota. One of the largest Minnesota companies is a company called Medtronic. They make these hard stents. I pray to Allah that you do not need one of those, but if you do, Medtronic makes very good stents. My mother recently had an operation in Bangladesh and we put two Medtronic stents in her heart. That stuff is made in Minnesota. The CEO of that company is a Muslim. One of the largest companies in Minnesota. So I got to know him. And one day I went to his house at an event. And there I met the previous CEO of that company. And so he and I started talking. And that previous CEO, the retired one, was now a Harvard professor. Definitely we are so happy to have on our ear. The company is more profitable than it has ever been. The stock prices are higher than it has ever been. So the Muslim does not only have to be a sheikh to deliver value to society. Right now, the Democratic Party is suffering from the biggest defeat it has suffered in the history of the Democratic Party. And one of the two people that they are thinking of electing as their chairman is a Muslim named Kitazi. How do you get to serve your country if you will not embrace it? How will this happen? How can that be? So, by the way, none of this is to say we do and have everything that is being done in America. There are many things that are done in this culture that are contrary to Islam. So we are not going to do that. In this culture, they have the concept of the beauty pageant where women have to come around half naked on the stage. And this is an Islamic pyramid with this. But also, by the way, the culture has many things that has no that Islam does not have a problem with. Part of the culture of this country is to play baseball. Why can we not embrace this? Part of the culture of this country is apple pie. Ahi, what you have against apple pie? Let's embrace it. See, and, and we have to be honest and, and valid about this. Is there a difference between the Egyptian culture and the Palestinian culture? Is there a difference between the Bangladeshi culture and the Pakistani culture? Yes, there is. And that's okay. Why can there not be an American culture consistent with Islam? You know, I'm from Bangladesh. There are some things in our culture that are un-Islamic. Those will change. And there are many things in our culture that Islam is okay with it. In fact, there are elements in our culture that are inherently Islamic. those we should celebrate, right? So American culture should be like that. And I'm going to end here uh, uh, knowing full well that the next speaker, I'm going to leave you, the audience, in very good hands, because she's an expert in culture and sociology. Literally, that's what she teaches at the university, right?
She's, she's trying to be modest. Uh, I apologize, I have to leave early because the assignment will give a chutbah somewhere, but I don't even fully know where it is. Uh, but anyway, Jazakumullah khairan, wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.